Yeah, there's a lot. All right, so we're just gonna start as soon as we see a number of participants that around matches the amount of people that signed up. And what was that number again, Cole? Um, 98. Yeah, that that was interesting because yesterday it was like 87. Yeah. So that's frightening. You guys have made us feel very honored and very terrified. So we hope that you really enjoy this presentation. Also, um, yes, you are muted. Not you, Colin. <laughs> I was I was worried for a second. I was like, this whole time. <laughs> okay. Oh, we got 72 people. Awesome. Wow. Really hope we can live up to whatever expectations people have for us. I'm sure we will. We, we've put a lot of hard work into this for you guys. Mm -hmm. So. Alrighty, I feel I feel like we can we can start getting into it now. We can always start with like the acknowledgement and stuff. All right. All right. Okay. All right. So before we start, we acknowledge that Toronto is in the dish with one spoon territory. The dish with the dish with one spoon territory is a treaty between the Anishinaabe and Mississaugas and the Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans, and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. We further acknowledge that the Toronto District School Board is hosted on the lands of the Mississaugas of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Wendat. We also recognize the enduring presence of all First Nations, Métis, and the Inuit peoples. We encourage you to research the original occupants of the land where you reside. Uh, this is just a little disclaimer. Uh, this is going to be recorded. It's going to be re-uploaded on the YouTube. Uh, all of this chat and the Q&A and the usernames and stuff are going to remain within the, ses the session. Um, and yeah, we want this to be a positive, insightful, and supportive experience. So welcome to our presentation on character design. My name is Cole Canning. And my name is Kate Snyder. Okay, so let's begin. This is our presentation outline. So first, introduction. What is character design? Why is it important? Some examples, um, good character design, bad character design, what makes one particular design strong and effective and what doesn't. Um, development and inspiration, getting inspired, like, see, like figuring out ways to start making a character and techniques. So what things you can use to actually make your character. All right, number one, what is character design and why is it important? Okay, so character design is Pretty simple, it's the process of giving your character an appearance. Basically, just showing your audience what your character looks like. It's pretty straightforward. Okay, and now, why is it important? That's, that's a more interesting question. So basically, it allows your audience to actually connect with your characters. They can see your characters, they can get an idea about who they are. It also shows, um, it also shows everyone that which work is yours so that it's not just the same kind of designs you're getting over and over and over again. Everyone can see this is your work. If anyone can hear my dog, don't. <laughs> um, also, you have to show the audience which character is which. Okay, so now let's go over some examples of effective versus ineffective designs. Okay, so this is strong character design. It's distinct from characters in other works. Because once again, you want people to know which characters are part of your work. You don't want them to go, it's that blonde person from something, something. Basically, you want people to know where your characters are coming from. And you also want the characters to remain distinct from each other. So you know, basically, who is doing what. Because like, if you can see these pictures here, none of these characters look exactly the same. Like. You can tell each one of them is their own unique individual, and basically, you know who they are. Also, original design. Once again, it feeds back into differentiation, and basically, you just want people to be able to know your work is unique to you. Cole will get into more specifics on that later, but another thing you need to remember is 
It has to make sense to the setting, the character, or the plot, or all of them. So basically, just you want to make a character that their design actually, well, it makes sense of why they are dressed that way they are because of like some characteristics like personality traits or maybe they're in a setting where they're wearing a snowsuit because it's cold or there's something in the plot that mandates why they appear the way they do. Okay. Quick character design. Now right here are two characters I personally designed and hated every minute of it. Okay, so first off we have the bland character design. It's it's a very cliche look. You notice it's just a, a person in a skirt. Um, they just, there's not that much going on that really tells you anything about this person. They are, it's just, it's just kind of a blob of purple if you've noticed, like, because while you could make some aspects of this character stand out more, it's just, it's just kind of this monotonous purple color and there's not much that really stands out about them. And I'm gonna guess that there's probably at least like 80 other characters you've seen that look more or less like this. So it's not really gonna stand out in its own work. So there's that. And then there's another issue here where, um, well, we don't know anything about them and it's not really great for the formats designed for because this is more or less designed to be a cartoon character, so part of the animation. And this is, thing is covered in a bunch of weird stripes, which would not be fun to animate. Because another issue with animation is, well, just in film in general, you don't really want to have a whole lot of stripes because that can look really weird on the screen. And then, because if you're doing just traditional 2D animation, you're going to be drawing the same thing over and over and over and over again. And having a ton of pretty unnecessary details like this is just, it's just going to be time consuming and doesn't really have any point. And over here, we have the over the top design. And the over the top design, it's the opposite issue here. It's the issue that there's too many really distinct features going on. So if you can see here, you've got angel wings, devil wings, what's possibly a bow, like a cybernetic arm and a pig leg. So that doesn't make any sense. You've got a you've got third place metal there, you've got stars in the hair and a flaming eye and what is either a mask or teeth. Basically, there's so much going on here, your audience doesn't really know what's important to know about this character. Because one thing you always want to know when you're looking at a character is just something about them. And this, there's so much important stuff apparently going on here that you don't actually know what really matters. So you just have this very confusing look because that's another thing because the color palette, it's really, really bold and it's making everything also stand out. So that feeds back into, you don't know what's important and just, it's just very confusing to look at. So, yeah. And on to development. So we're gonna start developing your, your very own characters. Okay, so this is the development process. Getting inspired, finding reference material, um, personality and characterization, design, different iterations, and the finished product. Okay, so these are some photos I've taken. Um, but basically, this is just different ideas of like ways you can get inspired. I did not take photos of other people on account of I could not actually get anyone's permission and did not want to be sued for posting images of them online. But basically, so you've got um, a picture of um, London and a sunrise. I did hang out the window to take that shot. Um, you've got a dog on the subway with sunglasses and a rainbow. The rainbow was actually a complete rainbow, but unfortunately that file was too big to post. Anyway, these are all different ways you can get inspiration. It's not just limited to like looking at other people. Like you can think like, if you see like that street, who would be on there? Like, who do you think would be like up at like 6.30 in the morning? Just like, would they be going to work? Would they be running away? Like, what do you think that person would be doing? If you see that rainbow, do you think like, oh, it would be like some kind of mystical rainbow goddess? Or maybe it's just like people out on a trip. It's a good way to think about what your characters are doing and just 
You also have this dog on the subway. That could be an interesting design. You could make a dog with sunglasses or maybe even go with something else. And um, basically just the idea is you got to look outside things. You got to understand that there's, there's a world around you. And you are the only one who's actually ever going to experience life the way you do. So this is a good way to make sure things are authentic and original when you're making your work. Like, if you go down the street, like, if another person were to walk down the street after you, they'd see things probably differently. They'd notice different things. This is all just a way of, like, creating a character that comes from you. You should also, like, go out and ask people about ideas you have and talk to them. Another thing I like to do is, like, when I'm making characters, I like to relate them to things that I know. Like, when I make costumes, because I actually do sew, I like to think about, like, what sort of fabrics would be, like, would actually work for this character. Like, there's a character I have that's kind of acrobatic. So I remember that if you're making, like, really stretchy outfits, you want to have, like, specific panels cut out. Well, not cut out, but basically an extra little patch around, like, the armpits or knees or places. Um, so that it's actually more flexible and it's easier to move around. So yeah, drawing from your own life is a really good place to start. And next, on to the setting. Settings. This is very important. Like, I know that you might be thinking that, oh, this is just world building, we're getting off topic. We are not. You see, if you actually look here, so we've got um, a creepy graveyard, a creepy city, and apparently mountains. And basically it gives you an idea about where your character is because where you are really does affect like, like how you're dressed as, like what you might look like. Like if say you're in um, a city, maybe you're wearing like, um, maybe like a fashionable blazer or something, or basically just like where you are affects how you and you always have to remember, so if you have like a character in a fantasy world, chances are they're not gonna be wearing like a fashionable blazer from like to the 2000s or something. They might be wearing armor or maybe, maybe they are not like a knight or anything. Maybe they're like a peasant and they're not gonna be dressed in armor then. So just remember like where they are affects what they look like. And also just like, it also gives you an idea about just more inspiration from where you're thinking of, where the character is like, uh, sorry, I'm getting off topic here. But basically it can inspire you to come up with more ideas if you think about where your character is. Next what? <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay, body types. This is, this is something to remember. This is about differentiating your characters from each other. So if you see here, um, we've got some pretty different body types. We've got someone who's a little bit bigger, someone who's really skinny, and someone who's fairly muscular. And remember when I said earlier, you not only want to differentiate your work from other works, you want to be able to differentiate your characters from characters within your work. And one way to do that is to give different body types, because if you're not giving different body types, you drastically reduce the amount of um, variables you actually have to work with to differentiate your characters. If you all end up with the same body type, well, then you have to start having to rely on different details. And if you just start out with very different looks just from the get-go, then it's much easier for everyone to know who this character is, what they're doing, and just, just know that they are a different person from everyone else. It's also a good way to actually think about just um, why they look the way they do. Like if say a person works out a lot, they're probably gonna be muscular and you might wanna show that in your design so people know that about your character. Okay, next slide. Okay, personality and characterization. Okay, so if any of you were wondering, personality definitely factors into your character design. Like one thing you wanna think about is what's your character trying to portray about themselves? Like, it doesn't have to be like a direct um, thing where your characters say like dressing up really fancily just to show that they're very prim and proper. It can be other things like if you see this alien I made on the side. So this character might not be actively trying to look scary or something, but basically what I did was I didn't add too many facial features. I gave it these very elongated arms. I made it very, very skeletal because I wanted to give this thing a feeling of menace. So you know right from the start. This guy is 
probably not going to be your friend. You're probably not going to have an ET situation there. And just basically like without the facial features, it's a lot harder to actually tell what this, what this character is thinking, which once again is a little bit creepy. It's a little bit, it's weird. It's pretty abnormal. Next to it, you see you've got this guy who's basically, he's clearly like screaming or something. He's got a giant sword and he's got armor. So like right away, you can kind of tell this guy might be kind of aggressive. You can also tell that this guy is maybe maybe some kind of soldier, but he's clearly not like the well-funded, like um, super elite kind. Like his, his armor's kind of beat up, but you've got an idea about who this guy is right from the start. And then over, he, over here are some characters from Steven Universe. So you can just very easily tell different things about these characters. And you want, the, and you want your designs to reflect that because one thing about designs is like, you want to actually tell your audience something about the character you're looking at. You want them to see like what's important there. And so like, you can see like one girl's got the, um, got the robotic arm. So you've really know like, they've got like some futuristic technology on them. And just basically you want that actually to reflect something about the character, either something they're trying to tell you or something you just need to know off the get go about the personal and characterization. So basically just, you wanna be able to just tell your audience something important. <laughs> yep, yeah, I've been talking for a while. Okay, so a couple of things when I'm developing characters that I do is, um, one thing I'll do is I'll design their room. This is a pretty good way of just, um, if you're having trouble or you're really pushing it, but you can't really figure out that much about a character, it's a good way of just kind of stepping back and trying a new, a new path to approach things. So basically I try and, Try and think of my characters, like what would, what's the best way to, to show these characters if they're not actually there? So I make a room. Of course, you don't need to do this if your character does not have a room, but like right here, I wanted to have a character as a bit, bit of a normal person. So I gave them just this kind of light purple um, color palette, a fairly standard sort of room. Um, and next to it, I had like an evil villain's lair. So you clearly have some idea about who this person is and what they're doing. They've got all these creepy screens and an odd hammock bed for some reason, like a server. And then on top of that, another thing you can do is just, if you're really stuck, just draw your character. And I know that sounds kind of weird, but it's just, it kind of forces you to think about what this character, what this character looks like. Um, like what kind of stuff would they be up to? And I like trying to um, draw my characters in like a pose or position that I'm trying to actually tell you as much about the character as I think is important to them. Like right here, like you've got a character who um, is dressed up all kind of sports-like. So you can probably get the idea that this person likes sports. And if I feel that um, the, the current design doesn't really explain anything about them or includes unnecessary details, because that's another thing, just drawing them out will also give you an idea of this, of like, are these details really necessary or are they just time consuming to draw? Because you don't really want to make a character that's time consuming if it doesn't have to be. And then over here, I have a height chart. I drew it, I think in about grade 10. Um, but basically, this is another way of uh, making sure that your character's roles do not overlap. Because once again, you want your characters to be differentiated. And, and it can be really difficult to not accidentally make characters that are super redundant, especially if you're kind of a partial to any specific um, um, character archetype. Like right here, just like it's a good way of like lining them up and thinking, okay, so that one's a good guy, that one's a bad guy, that one's a trickster, that one's a fighter, something like that. And basically you can just kind of tell, like if you're getting like more and more characters that are kind of all kind of converging on the same sort of role. Cause if you start in, if you start counting, you're like, so that one's a villain, that one's a villain, that one's a villain, oh no. And in that case, what I'll do is like, I'll just see like if one of them like fulfills the role better and kind of portrays what I'm trying to portray a lot in a lot more stronger ways, then I'll just, then I'll keep that character. If I feel like I have characters that both kind of embody particular roles that I think are pretty strong or they're showing it in equally good ways, then what I'll do is I will combine the characters and I'll just 
mix them up, make a new character. Or I'll just keep a character in and a couple traits from another character in. But yeah, these are just these are just ways of making sure that you're not making your roles redundant because you don't want that. And then your story can get a little bit wonky. All right. Okay. All right. I am gonna swoop in and save Kate. Uh, and do my part of the presentation. So I'm gonna be talking about real quick about um, how to use the internet to find inspiration. Because as we all know, the internet has an abundance of everything that you could ever think of. Um, it's a great thing to see a piece of work and uh, or to see somebody's character and have it inspire you to make something new. That's just a great thing. Um, and so the internet is a great place to collect a ton of material that inspires you and stuff that is relate to your, related to your character concept. So Pinterest and We Heart It are great websites for this kind of stuff. Um, and this is because you can make boards. Uh, so these are some examples of uh, inspiration boards. Uh, this one would be for like a sort of like elf character. And this one is for a, like a pirate character. Um, as you can see, it's a diverse group of images, but it has uh, one cohesive uh, character theme, this one being elf and this one being pirate. Um, no designs are exactly the same, and that's important, which we'll get into later, because uh, the goal is not to copy anybody's design. And as soon as we get into the realm of uh, getting inspired on the internet, it's important for us to make a clear distinction between um, getting inspired and plagiarizing. <laughs> so let's just uh, go over that real quick because unfortunately art theft is rampant on the internet. So we don't wanna accidentally turn you guys into art thieves. So let's go over this real quick. So what is the difference between being inspired versus plagiarizing something? Um, we're gonna look into what you should be doing and what you shouldn't be doing. So you should be getting inspired by the work of others. Like we don't wanna be scaring you out of getting inspired by other work because that's a great thing. Uh, almost everything has been done before. And the beautiful thing about art is how it can create these like ripple effects of people being inspired to create more art. Um, so definitely get inspired by other people. Um, you should use multiple sources. I kind of mentioned this earlier. Uh, this is because uh, if you are only using one source, you might accidentally take too much from that one source and then have your finished character end up looking like a bootleg of the original. And you don't want that. That's plagiarism. So make sure you're using a lot of sources. Um, uh, you absolutely can reference elements of a design to make your own creation. Like for example, if you see a character and you really like the way that the artist drew the jewels on their crown and your character has a jewel encrusted belt, maybe you wanna reference that piece for how you draw the, the, the jewels and that's fine. Um, and then finally, you should be crediting the original artist when a character is heavily inspired or if you've like, if you've referenced a key element of their character or an element that was very unique to their character, you should be crediting the original artist if you're gonna share it, just be like, oh, and I referenced from at this artist or I was inspired by at this artist. And worst case scenario, if, if the original artist thinks your art is too similar to theirs, they will probably just polite you, politely ask you to take it down, um, which you then do and no harm, no foul. <laughs> Um, so now let's get into what you should not do. Uh, you should basically never, ever, ever trace over the work of others or heavily reference a specific piece. These are kind of the same thing. The only difference being that tracing is using, um, uh, like see through paper or a digital art program to directly trace over someone's work and heavily referencing is basically when you look at a picture and you try to copy it line by line. Um, you shouldn't be doing these things. This is plagiarism. The really the only reason that you would ever like the only reason you could ever have to trace over someone else's work or to do the heavily referencing thing is if you are just getting started with art and are using it as a learning exercise. But even in this situation, you should still have no intent to share it uh, with anyone and no intent to claim it as your own. Um, and know that although tracing and heavily referencing can teach you certain things about art, it really isn't the best way to learn to draw. Um, anyway, and yeah, don't ever omit credit when you're sharing heavily inspired or inspired work. This is just common courtesy, credit artists when you reference their work or are inspired by it. Um, so let's visualize the difference real quick. Um, this is a little character that I drew for the, for the sake of uh, demonstration. 
Uh, so we're going to look at the difference between uh, like the derivatives of this piece, one that is traced, one that is referenced, and one that is inspired. So here's the traced piece. This is plagiarism because it is a blatant retracing of the original design. It's been recolored and the, the, the brush is kind of different for the line art, uh, but the differences end there. <laughs> Everything else is exactly the same. And this is not an original character. This is, a, this is plagiarism, don't, don't do this. Um, this is a referenced character. And the reason I put be careful is because referenced characters, uh, it's just a little bit of a slippery slope. So for this piece, uh, there are similarities to the original, of course. They're both like bunny carrot farmers. They're both wearing a straw hat, but the style is completely different. Uh, you know, the ears are up instead of down. There's no flower, there's no bucket. This bunny is wearing overalls. Like there are certain differences, but obviously aspects of the original character have been referenced. And if you did this or the, the hypothetical artist who did this wanted to share it, they should be crediting the original artist still in this case. So now let's look at an inspired piece. So this piece is what the inspired is what you want to be aiming for. Uh, this piece is the result of the artist seeing the original piece and having it inspire a new character. So the original piece and this piece look cohesive together because this character here was inspired by this character, uh, but they're still unique and distinct from each other. Uh, you know, they both have the, the bunny thing going on, they both have a flower, they're both dressed in red, but that's pretty much it. And they're, they're clearly different characters, even though one was inspired. And so credit probably wouldn't necessarily be necessary, <laughs> necessarily be necessary. Credit probably wouldn't be necessary in this situ situation, but that's not to say that you shouldn't give credit anyway, because honestly, artists get really, really happy <laughs> when, when you make work that's inspired by their work. Um, I remember one time I posted a painting on my art account and this girl, she looked at the painting and she like interpreted it in her own way and then went and wrote a poem that she like, like was inspired from what her paint, what my painting was making her think about. Um, and she sent it to me and it made me so happy. So like, definitely feel free to still like give artists a tag when uh, your work is inspired from those because it makes us really happy. <laughs> um, all right, so now we're gonna get into uh, techniques that you can use in the design process. So firstly, using shapes. Um, shapes can be extremely effective tools in characterization, uh, which basically means conveying a character's personality through their appearance. Uh, I'm gonna be using characters from the show Steven Universe uh, to demonstrate this because they use shapes in a very effective way uh, to communicate information about their characters. So first we have Steven, whose character is made up of circles. We have, um, we have Peridot, whose character is made up of triangles. And we have uh, Garnet, whose character is made up of rectangles or squares and rectangles. Um, so let's go into what kind of characterization each of these shapes delivers. So starting with circles. Circles are very often used in the character designs of children and protagonists, uh, typically the, the good guys. Um, they communicate that a character is innocent, friendly, warm, and welcoming. Um, triangles, on the other hand, are most often used in the character designs of villains and antagonists. Um, they communicate that a character is eccentric, strong, smart, and cunning. Um, and squares are often used in the character designs of sidekicks, and supporting characters. Um, squares communicate that a character is wise, dependable, trustworthy, and loyal. So you may be wondering how these simple shapes are capable of communicating such detailed information about a character. Um, and the answer to that question lies in the nature of the shape itself. Um, circles are soft and round. They have no hard edges, and that's why they give this sort of warm, welcoming vibe. Um, it's very hard to design a menacing looking character using only circles, but it probably could be done. Um, uh, triangles are sharp, pointy, and they are, I would say, a little eccentric <laughs> in uh, contrast to other shapes. And this is why they're so often used in the character design of antagonists. Squares and rectangles are stable and secure. Um, and so that's why they communicate that a character is wise and trustworthy. These are definitely not definitive rules 
they're more just guidelines that you can use to your advantage to communicate extra information about a character. One of my favorite quotes about art is that you have to uh, know the rules before you can break them. And that's basically what I'm saying here. Like you can combine different shapes, like say you wanted to create an evil henchman character um, and you might decide to use squares and triangles to communicate that it, you know, they're evil and cunning, but they're wise and dependable uh, to the rest of their evil buddies. Or you could even go the complete opposite direction and choose to make like an ironic design of, uh, you know, make a villain out of only circles. A really good example of this is uh, the antagonist in Secret Life of Pets. It's a little bunny called Snowball. <laughs> and obviously uh, the Snowball's character design is mostly made up of circles, which typically isn't, aren't used for villains, but it just creates this amazing comedic effect and like irony uh, to its character. That's really great. So um, yeah, these guidelines are here to play with, you know, like do a dodecahedron character for all I care. Um, all right, now using color. So color is another useful tool to communicate information about a character's personality. Um, for this example, I'm going to be using uh, characters from the movie Inside Out because the way that this movie uses colors in the character design is very effective in communicating elements of their character. And for those of you who have seen Inside Out know, uh, most of the characters are directly uh, representative of a specific emotion. So <laughs> these character designs are a little more a nail on the head than your typical character with a complex personality, but that actually works really well for this example uh, to show exactly what each color communicates. So we have anger, who is red. We have joy, who is yellow. We have disgust, who is green. We have sadness, who is blue. We have fear, who's a light purple. And we have Riley's imaginary friend, Bing Bong, who is pink with a purple tail and orange legs and a rainbow pin. <laughs> So you can probably already tell just from observation that these are very, very fitting color choices uh, to match each character. Uh, the character designers for Inside Out made a lot of really smart decisions here, uh, and I'll, I'll go over them. Um, a lot of you have probably heard the phrase, uh, I got so angry I started seeing red. Um, so obviously anger's red is very fitting. Um, a lot of us associate uh, sunshine with happiness, and so Joy's sunny yellow is very fitting to her design. Um, Disgust's green design is based off of the cartoon trope where a character will turn green before they throw up. And uh, fun fact, that that trope is, is based off how food turns green when it like goes off. Um, we have Sadness, who is uh, blue from the phrase, the common phrase, uh, to be feeling blue. Uh, meaning to feel sad. We have fear, who is this light shade of purple, and purple fear doesn't really, um, like the emotion of fear doesn't really have a color association other than the fact that we turn pale when we're scared, um, but you can actually see that this is reflected in fear's uh, character design because it's a very light purple, and uh, you know the rest of his character design also just manages to really capture this like sense of unease and nervousness. Um, and we, for Bing Bong, uh, his pink body, his rainbow pin, and basically every other element of his design, uh, they totally just capture the sense of like childhood wonder, imagination, and creativity, uh, which is everything that you would expect to see in the character design for a child's imaginary friend. So as we've established, colors tend to play a role in giving viewers a certain impression of who a character is. Uh, similar to shapes, certain colors tend to communicate certain information about a character, and I won't read each one individually, but feel free to screenshot this list. Um, this is a list of some basic attributes that each color tends to communicate when used in character design. Um, and of course, as I said earlier about shapes, these are not hard, fast rules that you're never allowed to break. They're just, um, you know, they're just guidelines. Uh, for example, blue, uh, it may be supposed to communicate stability, but like, there's no rule saying that you can't make a chaotic blue character. You know what I mean? You could still totally do that. Um, this list mostly functions as an optional way to accent certain elements of your character's personality through color. Um, and as shown through Inside Out, this can be very effective when it's done correctly. And even if you do plan, plan to follow these guidelines, uh, as Kate sort of said earlier, uh, when they were talking, when they were showing the bland character design, it's very hard to make a character design work with only one color. So even if you do use this guide, like combine colors. 
And uh, now that we're on the topic of color combinations, I have a little plug for a good website you guys should use. Um, it's called Adobe Color. Uh, a lot of you guys have probably heard of Adobe and uh, their software products like Photoshop and Illustrator and Premiere and After Effects and stuff like that. Adobe is pretty much the industry standard for uh, most types of creative production. They make very powerful software and that's pretty much always reflected in the price tag. It's very expensive, but this website is completely free, which is awesome because who doesn't love free stuff? Uh, it is a very helpful tool uh, to create beautiful and cohesive color palettes. So you can uh, set your color harmony settings to um, analogous, monochromatic, triadic, complementary, or any, any of these. Um, and then the webs you, you pick a single color and the website like automatically picks colors that harmonize with it in the way that you chose. Um, and then you can then fine tune the other colors uh, to have the color palette uh, perfectly fit whatever vision you have. Um, this website is awesome because as much as people like to act like there is absolutely no relationship between art and math, I disagree because color theory is very mathematical. Like hex codes, which are what you see over here and like RGB values and HSB values, all of that stuff, it's very mathematical. Um, and you know, when it comes to achieving a visually pleasing uh, color palette, there's a lot of math involved in, in like, uh, you know, they're applying formulas onto the color value to pick colors that look nice with it, which I just think is awesome. But Adobe does all the heavy lifting for you. So don't worry, you don't have to do any math. I just think it's interesting. Um, and you just end up with stunning color palettes. So definitely use this website. This website is awesome. All right, this is a technique called the silhouette test. The silhouette test is a technique that you can use to determine how unique and recognizable your character is. Um, the idea is that your character should still be recognizable even when you can only see their silhouette. So there are a couple examples of the silhouette test on the screen and I'll give you guys a quick second and you can just look at them real hard and see if you can figure out who they are. Um, uh, so yeah. We've got Sully and Mike, we've got Powerpuff Girls, and we've got Sailor Moon. So I can't see your guys' faces, but you probably got at least a few of them. And if you didn't get one of them, it's probably because you just didn't know who they were. Um, but these characters are all examples of characters that absolutely pass the silhouette test with flying colors. Their silhouettes are totally unique and you can still tell who the character is. Um, even when you can't see any of the color. So here's a ton more examples of the silhouette test. I'm not gonna do reveals for all of these, don't worry. Uh, but I'll leave it on the screen for a second just as like a fun little activity to see how many characters you guys can recognize. Um, so, and of course, each design that you do recognize, it would pass the silhouette test. So you wanna make sure that your character passes the silhouette test because it means that uh, it's unique and distinct, which are obviously traits that you want. And now I'm gonna hand it back over to Kate. Okay, so if you remember all the way long ago when I was talking about the weak character designer, you'll remember that I said that one of the issues with it was that it didn't really work with the format that um, it was supposed to be in. Because one thing when you're making characters that you should always consider what the actual thing you're making is. Like if it's gonna be a cartoon, if it's gonna be a comic, like, because, so right here on the left, you can see, um, what was it, um, Corpse Bride. And um, so that's a stop motion uh, movie and it's done with these little um, figures, which are already made. Like you can swap out faces and pose parts, but you're still already made um, figures. So they're gonna have like lots of little details because you don't have to be constantly adding those back on. Well, at least not in the same way that you'll be doing like say a, traditional 2D animation, which is on the right. And so basically you can get away with a lot more detail. And one thing is with movies, you get a lot of close-ups. So you can get away with adding a lot more detail because that's a lot more interesting to look at if say your character is like an interesting texture on like their shirt or something, than if it's just like kind of a blank, like sleek, just like red or something. 
We get little details that's a lot more visually appealing. On the, in the middle, we have a picture of a Superman comic. And you see there's um, a lot more detail than you can see in the Naruto um, picture on the right. Um, and that's because, well, in mainstream comics, it's actually not just one person drawing these things. You actually have, you, you have sketch artists, you have inkers, you have um, colorists. And basically, so this image was not, well, it was probably not drawn by one person. It was likely drawn by at least three other people. So what we have here is um, basically, because they're also not moving around constantly, you can get away with adding just lots and lots more detail because it's just e like for each image, it's just like a still picture. And, um, and then on the right, we have Naruto and that's a traditional 2D animation show unless things have changed. But basically, <laughs> um, so as you can see, you're not getting like a whole lot of detail compared to the other two. You get um, basic um, shell, uh, cell shading. That was a fun tongue twister there. Um, but basically, so that's where you just use like two colors. You're not getting any blending when you um, uh, actually shade the image. And so what happens is you have pretty simplistic images there. Because once again, like I said way back earlier in the beginning of the presentation, like these, these characters to make them uh, move, you're going to be drawing them over and over and over and over again. And that's really time consuming. That can be kind of costly. So you get more simplistic designs like this. What? Yep. Okay, so this is a fun monstrosity called the Uncanny Valley. Okay, my opinion is, always beware of the uncanny valley. It has its uses, but you should be aware of it. So right in the middle is a picture I drew. Just, just give it a nice hard look and maybe imagine it in your bedroom at night. But <laughs> basically, so it's, it's realistic, but it's, it's just, it's full of these odd, unnecessary details. And it's like, once again, it's realistic, but that thing is not lifelike. That thing is, that thing is off. Like, you know, it's a human probably, Sleep her but human. yeah, it's just, it's just off-putting and it does not look natural. Just, you've got these weird wide eyes. I drew this in a symmetry program just because I wanted to show you all the special thing known as the uncanny valley. And then on the right, we have a graph I made simplified to explain exactly how the uncanny valley works. And basically it's how human-like something is versus how much you actually like it. So way at the bottom, we have like, say just a conveyor belt type robot, not that interesting. So it's just, it's just saying that's not human. You don't really feel anything about it. And then if you go back and then you start to go up, you've got um, uh, anime characters. And so, they're like usually drawn fairly human-like if they're human. And, but you don't get too much detail in the face. So it's still pretty likable. It's, it's not super realistic, but you're not probably gonna hate it um, just by looking at it. I'm not gonna say anything about your specific opinions towards any characters, but just in general, it's not like saying that like the monstrosity in the middle, you're not just gonna go, oh, that's bad. And then we suddenly drop right down to the bottom. And right there you have early 2000s CGI characters. Like, and then have you seen like really, really old Toy Story, like the first Toy Story? Have you seen Andy, you know? You know Andy, that kid who kinda lives inside the nightmares of children everywhere. If you notice, the 2000s it, was just like animators trying to figure out a balance between realism and likability. They were struggling yeah. for and a second. If you notice, and um, basically, if you notice in the newest Toy Story movie, they have redesigned Andy. Andy does not look like Andy from way back in that nightmare age of CGI. And just, it's just this weird place where something is human uh, human enough that you know it's supposed to be a human. It's not like this is confusing. You know it's human, but it's just, 
off. And that makes you immediately kind of recoil in absolute disgust. And then you go right back up and then you get to normal human. And just, it's not like you're immediately gonna recoil in disgust. Well, you might, but humans kind of suck, but <laughs> basically it's not something that's gonna immediately make you freak out. So when you're and you're using the Uncanny Valley, it's just well. One thing is that a lot of the time people think that detail automatically means your work is good, and I'm sorry to tell you, but that's not actually true. Adding tons and tons of detail can just become unnecessary and time-consuming, and you don't want to be spending forever trying to add on every single little hair when it's just not going to matter in the long run. And if you add too much, you end up with that. So basically, you have to perform a balancing act of how much is too much. And there are some uses of the Uncanny Valley. Like if you want to create um, a really freaky villain or something, or just a monster, you might want to go with the Uncanny Valley deck to create that just immediate feeling of just disgust or fear. But you probably don't want to be using it all the time just on account of, it's just very creepy and weird. <laughs> okay, next slide. Same face syndrome. This is an issue that tends to um, plague everything. Basically, on the left, these are some, these are some images I've drawn. And you can all tell these are different people. And I'm going to then tell you, I copied copied and pasted the exact same face for all of them. I did not redraw this. I wanted to show you all just, just how same face syndrome works. Because if you look on the right, you've got these characters here. They're not particularly well drawn. It took me about two and a half minutes to make this, maybe slightly more. But basically, these guys, they all have different face shapes, kind of like um, Cole said earlier with the different um, shapes. I base them off a circle, triangle, and square, so you kind of get that idea from them. But they don't have any color. And if I were to take away their hairstyles, you would not be confused. You would know exactly who is who. If, you, if I took out like any weird attributes besides just the face, you would know who these people are. You would know they are not the same person. If I were to take out the color and the hairstyles and any attributes, from these characters on left, well, then we'd have a fun guessing game on our hands. It wouldn't make sense anymore. You wouldn't know who was who. You, you didn't. You wouldn't want. You wouldn't know anything. And just that's an that's an issue because if say you're using the same body type and you're using the same faces, well, typically then you're limited to color palette, clothing, hair, and eyes usually to actually mess around with to make characters, which is, that's four things. And that's, that's not a lot. And what can happen is, as you're trying really hard to differentiate your characters, because you want to make sure that your audience knows who is who. You want to make sure that your audience knows who your protagonist is and who your villain is. Or maybe it's a, just an antagonist, a protagonist can be on this too. But basically you want your audience to know who is who, but Eventually, if you're adding more characters, you end up with the, often you end up in the very bad situation known as you start having to add a bunch of weird stuff because you're trying to make sure people know and you are, you start to run out of um, options. Like, because depending on the setting, you only can have a limited amount of like outfits and stuff. Like if it's say medieval times, it's not gonna make all that much sense if your character is like wearing like a futuristic uniform or something. So basically you start running out of options and you'll start adding weirder stuff. Like maybe a character has like two pupils and one eye or, and just things can quickly start to stop making sense. Your um, character designs can just kind of, well, also stop making sense. So if you're, so basically if you're making characters, you want to differentiate them. You want people to know who is who all the time. This, this is very important also if you're not good at drawing consistently. Because even if you're not drawing super consistently, if your characters look different enough, that's not going to be too much of an issue. So a good way to um, counteract same face syndrome is just start out with different shapes. Like 
Like one character space, it could be like a star, it could be a circle, it could be a dodecahedron. But basically what you want there is just, you want to start off right from the beginning. These characters look different. And that way it's a lot easier to use different features or something just so people know who is who. Just so you're not going to go like, okay, I'm just gonna draw a circle and then I'll draw these two eyes and I'll differentiate this later. Nope, you wanna go right from the get-go. These characters are different. Okay, next slide. <laughs> okay, so the finished project, the product. Um, cool, do you wanna start us off? Yeah, sure. Okay, so uh, these, we've put a bunch of different uh, like, finished characters that uh, Kate and I have designed on the slides. Uh, these uh, three are theirs and these two are mine. Um, and basically we're just gonna talk about uh, what makes each of these an effective character design, taking into consideration everything we've just learned. Do you wanna start with yours or do you want me to start with mine? You can start with yours. Okay, so here we have a piece of a siren uh, with a man drowning. So I chose this piece because I think that it's a pretty solid example of characterizing, uh, of characterization through the use of color uh, on the siren. Like I used a lot of cool tones uh, in this piece and uh, also through the setting, obviously, because it's like there's stuff going on in this photo. So the, the idea that I kind of had behind it was I wanted this piece to be like up for interpretation and up for people to kind of read into how they would characterize the siren in their head. Um, because obviously, you know, the, the mythology exists of sirens are these creatures, these like mermaid creatures that uh, sing and they seduce sailors into swimming into the sea towards them and drowning. Um, so basically, it was supposed to be up for interpretation in this piece, what the sirens intentions are in this moment, because, uh, you know, her hand not grabbing his arm back, her hands just loose um, with all of the skulls kind of uh, like implies like murderous intent. But then also there's this expression on her face that looks almost like pitiful or like conflicted. Um, so I just thought this was a good example of characterization because there's a lot that you can read into about this piece and a lot that you can have your own interpretation of what exactly is going on in this situation, in this piece. Um, and this one right here, uh, this piece is actually a collaboration that I did with my friend Aiden. Um, his Instagram is right over here. You guys should follow him. Uh, his art is great. Um, he did the line art and I colored it because he's really, really good at line art and I'm really good at coloring. Uh, so we just kind of combined our strong points. Um, and basically, I really love this character. I, I love the, the amount of characterization that uh, is, uh, went into it. Like we have all these band-aids on the legs and bandages on the wrists that kind of, uh, you know, that kind of insinuate that he's a little juvenile getting into all sorts of trouble, you know, getting dinged up here and there. And then <laughs> I also just love his like questionable fashion sense. Like we see, we see he's, he's rocking the, the socks and sandals <laughs> game. Um, and he's got the Hawaiian shirt. Um, he, it just gives him like this like super eccentric vibe that I really love. And yeah, I just love him. I think he's so rad. And I think that I could totally see him being like the protagonist or a sidekick in a comic book. Um, so yeah, those are my two examples. Kate, you want to do yours? Okay, so these three characters are actually all for um, a superhero comic I've been working on. Um, I have not posted any pages. I'm still writing some parts. But basically, um, so these are three different characters. They're done in different styles because I've been experimenting with like what sort of style that I specifically want to go with. Like, how long does this one take? How like can I actually use it? Does it work for the comic I'm making? And um, so right on the left, we have this one girl. She is meant to be based off of the sort of um different toxic creatures. They all ended up being sea creatures by accident. But we have um, blue ringed octopus, blue dragon, um, sea cucumber, um, Portuguese man of war jellyfish, um, got some sea urchins, and we've got anemones. And basically what I was doing with her is like, I wanted to give off this feeling of just this creepy sort of toxic idea. And Basically, so that's why I was using different um, different animals like that. But I also wanted it to stand out a little bit more because 
one thing I always find people are looking for like a toxic creature or like they're trying to get an idea of poison. They usually choose snakes. And I wanted my character to stand out a little more. So I was using some less known animals, but with very striking markings because usually like, like drawing from like real life, um, I know that often animals will use like very strong, um, very bright markings to, to explain, I'm dangerous, don't come near me. Like you get poisoned to start frogs, you get blue ringed octopuses. So I thought that was, a, well, octopi. So I thought that was a good idea to just sort of, like even if you don't really know what these animals are, you kind of get an idea about danger from her. And it just helps her set, helps set her apart a bit. Um, in the middle, we've got my antagonist. And I've actually edited his appearance a bit since I drew this. Um, I drew it last year, but basically I wanted to get this feeling of someone who's a very, very strong kind of over the top villain. So I was using um, purple and green as my color palette there because you see those are commonly associated with villains. Like if you go back like into early comics, you get a lot of villains that dress up in purple and green. So I wanted to give off that feeling. Um, He's meant to just look like someone who kind of just woke up really early in the morning and put on a costume and just did what they wanted all day. So I just wanted to give you a very over the top feeling. I've simplified his mask though um, recently because his mask was like meant to be super colorful and eccentric looking. And then I realized that takes forever to draw and I can't remember what it looks like ever. So I've simplified it down to only a couple patterns. Um, the different like sort of um, diamond patterns on his outfit are also just kind of based off a game board I saw once. And so I kind of thought that fit in. He's got the scary looking cape to give him that really strong villainous look. And then on the right, we have another character. And um, so she's meant to be kind of like a stealthy sort of character. And what I did was because I know that um, like contrary to what you usually see in um, fiction, you don't actually want to have like a straight black outfit if you're being stealthy. So everyone who wants to commit crimes, listen up. Um, basically, you actually want to wear sort of a modeled outfit because if you're wearing straight black, if you're looking around the dark and you see something that looks like a silhouette of a human being, you're probably gonna know that's a human being. So what you want is a modeled outfit because it breaks up the silhouette. Like, Instead of just having like straight black, you get like different um, shades and stuff. And that gives you an idea that, oh, um, maybe that's just like a piece of furniture or something because you can't quite make out just a straight black silhouette. But I also remember when I was trying to develop her because I actually went through a couple renditions. You can always remember it's always okay to edit. And because like your character might not be perfect the first time around, like you might take a couple different renditions to really get what you want. But basically I remember one thing I was thinking of like, I wanted to originally just have black shoes, but then I just had this idea of like having her like with these white soles. And there's another thing about um, fiction is you don't actually need to always follow reality all the time. And even if she's a stealthy character, I felt that would help her like be a bit more recognizable because I couldn't come up with a whole lot of stealth characters with these white souls. They also have more meanings, but I don't want to talk about those because I do want to publish this one day and that would be spoilers. But yeah, so I had these, these white souls. They kind of stuck out to me because she's also supposed to do a bunch of flips, you can see. And what I was thinking was like, those would be very recognizable every time. If you could see like this person like with their feet in the air, you'd remember those souls. And then you can see also that she's got this odd weapon on her. It was actually based off a combination of um, different types of weapons, including a chain side and a baton. And um, basically I thought that was also a good idea to kind of make her stand out because you got like a dozen characters all using swords. And I thought it'd be more interesting if I used something a little bit different. Um, what else? Her, her outfit is also fairly skin tight just because that's pretty typical of the superhero genre. And I did want to pay homage to that. Because like, even if like you're actually, once again, for stealth, you shouldn't actually be wearing anything skin tight because that makes your silhouette kind of obvious. This is fiction and I do get some leeway when it comes to actually designing a character. You should always remember that. You don't always need to adhere to reality, but your designs, once again, should make sense. And um, 
let's see one other thing is like these characters are all fairly slim but they do have slightly different builds one thing i was going with i do have characters with different builds than this just these are the ones i ended up picking but you see um i have my character on the left she is fairly slim but doesn't have very much muscle definition while the character on the right actually does have some muscle definition because i thought um, if this is a character supposed to be doing a lot of the back or backs, it's supposed to be flipping around, they're probably going to need some muscle power, and that would probably be kind of obvious. So um, that's what I said to add there. But yeah, just you can always experiment, you can always edit your designs. You don't need to be perfect the first time around. So it's best to just kind of work things out until you find something you're happy with. Yeah. So generally, um, you know, looking at all of these very, very different uh, finished character designs, um, what what ties them all together is that they're all pleasing to the eye. They all communicate the character's personality aesthetically, and they're all unique and distinct. And so this is all using all of the information that we've just discussed earlier in this presentation. So we really hope that you guys all enjoyed and learned something new and that it helps you design a character that you feel really proud of. So yeah, uh, if anyone has any further questions, uh, you can use the Q&A function and we'll try to answer it there. Um, I know that there was an option for people to ask questions before the meeting. And most of those questions, I feel like we included the answer in our presentation. Um, I, there was one question asking me about um, pixel art. Uh, and so I just want that whoever sent that question, um, message me on Instagram. Our, my Instagram will be up on the next slide and message me there because that, that's a very specific answer that kind of requires me to go more in depth. So I'm happy to just talk to you on oh. Instagram DMs. Um, there was a question about um, basing characters off of people you know in real life. Um, it's it's totally fine to like um, base a character off of someone you know, like you can like, like I actually do it all the time, like if there's like some certain traits or something I think would be interesting on a character or interpret another way, then I will use them in a character. But one thing you should be careful about is if you're naming a character after another person. Um, and this especially goes if you plan to kill this character off, because unfortunately that can be interpreted as a threat and you don't want to be sued for that. So you should always be careful. Um, like once again, real life is always the best place to look for. Like if you're trying to get ideas, like going down the street, saying like, oh, that person's dressed interestingly, like, better write that down. Or just like, huh, that's a new thing I didn't think of today, but I've saw it for some reason. I've seen it for some reason. Basically, just you can you can take things from real life. You can you can take ideas like just like how you've seen other people, but you should always avoid trying to insult someone or trying to threaten them. Yeah, no, 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 taking out your anger on people you know in your life through a character that is based on them and named after them. <laughs> just don't do that. Um, um, I'll go to the next slide. So that yeah. can a character exist without a story? Can the story exist without characters? Well, okay, that's an interesting question. Um, I can't see the Q&A. I don't know, my button isn't working. Can you just let me know what the questions are? Um, so, yes, a character um, actually, yeah, they can exist without oh, um, a story. Can a story exist without characters? Well, that tends to get really abstract, but yeah, sure, you can actually- Philosophy characters. <laughs> It might be fairly abstract and confusing. Well, it doesn't necessarily need to be, need to be confusing, but. That question actually like messes me up. Can a story <laughs> exist without characters? That's crazy. Ah, I don't, I can't think about that too hard. It's okay to use pose references directly from a model slash source. You can have people model for you, sure. But if you're using like, say like a trademark pose or whatever, then you might want to get careful. And but you there there also though, like there are a lot of like pose references on the internet that exist to help you. You know what I mean? Like like people like there are models who take pictures and like you know every angle with like different props and stuff like literally just for artists to like reference them. So that's great. Yeah. And I like I'll just pose in the mirror for myself if I really need to. Yeah, take pictures of yourself. That has that helped me before. Me? Yeah. Um, and then what is your advice on getting over art block? Um, and 
I, can I give my genuine advice? Okay, sure. My genuine advice, every time I have art block, it's hell and I just get like super depressed and I'm like, oh my God, why can't I make art? But here's the thing. I find that inspiration, it can't be perpetual. You can't always be inspired. And if you were always inspired, you would kind of never be inspired. You know what I mean? Like, uh, so the, the block, I try to look at it as a natural part of the inspiration pro process. Like there's always an ebb and flow to this stuff. You know what I mean? It has to ebb in order to flow because I find that every time I go through art block, it sucks and it's hell. But then as soon as I find the strength to pick up a pencil again and draw something that I really like, I feel like that drawing almost always ends up being like, better than my work before I was in art block so my honest advice is just to like just accept it accept that you're not inspired but accept that being not inspired is the first step to being inspired you know what I mean um another um piece of advice I have for um this person um uh just try a different um track like if I'm having trouble making a character I might design their room just Maybe just like go off on a different path and just try out new things because usually I find I get art blocks specifically for characters just when I'm pressing really, really, really hard at something and I've just kind of closed myself off to other ideas. So just open yourself up to things like ways things can just turn out. It doesn't need to be perfect. You can always edit, but just sort of, just sort of maybe look out, see, see your options. How do you draw poses without having to always search up the right pose? Oh, okay. Lots so, of anatomy practice. Once you get good enough at like drawing bodies, you will kind of start to be able to like, be able to draw bodies just from like your imagination, but that takes a lot of practice. Like I'm not even fully there yet. So yeah. Yeah, you, you just, that's more of a process of just practicing. Mm -hmm. just want to do it again and again you might get like a million weird looking drawings or something but eventually they'll get pretty good um you might just want to pose in the mirror or something just so you can sort of get the pose you're interested in if you're having issues looking up the specific pose online that's the problem oh one more thing for for that question uh there's a website uh it's called lineofaction.com um and basically you can go there and there you can draw bodies you can draw animals you can draw faces it's basically like a drawing exercise uh website if you guys have ever done like like gesture drawing uh basically it gives you like between like five and like ten or maybe even like two minutes and it just flashes images on the screen you can get like nude models to practice drawing bodies uh in like various different positions and just like try to do that and have each image only on the screen for like five minutes and just try to bang out as many as you can because that is a really good way to practice drawing bodies. Um, there's also, how would it work if we want to sell our work that's inspired from others through products like prints? Um, it, it would depend. It would depend. <laughs> yeah. and it, it seriously depends. Like if it's just like um, Cole showed earlier, like a really, um, if it's just like kind of referencing an image somewhat, then it's probably going to be fine because once again, basically everything's already been done mm -hmm. and it's nice to add on to things. But if you're like pretty much copying a character, then if you try and make money off of that, you can be sued. Yeah, um, and it kind of depends how like how big the like if it's like, you know, if you're doing fan art of like a popular character like in media, and selling it as a print, it really depends on what copyright laws are in place on that because you don't want to get slapped with a massive lawsuit from some big corporation. And also just like in general, um, like I, I actually have quite a good example. Um, uh, me and my friend Abby, who is doing a presentation on writing later on at eight that you guys should all go to if you haven't already registered for it. Um, one time she did a drawing she did the line art and then I colored it in uh, Photoshop and I like made it digital and I made it pixely. So it was a collaboration between us. Um, and I wanted to put that on my online store. So I just called her up and I asked her, hey, can I sell this in my online store? And if, if anyone buys it, like, I'll just give you 50%. And she was like, yeah. So if it's a small artist, 
and you're like using their character on a print or something, which is kind of similar to me and Abby's situation, just talk to them. Talk to them is always the best policy. Um, there's also any books slash videos on character design you recommend. Um, I know there's a series on YouTube about um, character design, but I don't remember what it was called. I remember one episode I saw was about character turnarounds. Oh yeah, character turnarounds is just drawing your character from like different angles, kind of like they're being spun around. It just makes sense. It just helps make sure that your character stays consistent in its appearance from all different angles. And um, basically just so if you have like a time that looks cool from the front, you can also make sure that it also looks cool from say the side. What are all the things you can do with a character after you've created it? You can so do much. everything with a character after you've created it. You could uncreate it. You were like, so you can make a comic, you could animate it, you could literally just do nothing. Like, you honestly, a character's life. Yeah, like with, with the characters that I make, honestly, most of the characters that I make, they just exist once in one drawing and then I draw something else. <laughs> you know what I mean? Whereas Kate more like, like develops her character or their characters more full, fully, yep. you know? And I spend many years on this. This yeah. is my life. So, Endless possibilities. Any other questions? Let's see any okay. others. Nope, there doesn't seem to be any more. All right. Um, if you have any other questions, you can uh, check our Instagrams. Um, Cole is at Cole Orr. It's not Cole Orr like I thought it was. Mm -hmm. um, and I am at Quantum Insanity. Oh, I think another question just appeared in the Q&A. Oh, I can't okay. click it. I just see a notification. Okay. Oh yeah, oh wait, 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 sorry, sometimes it scrolls back up. Can you replicate the character and style of someone else's work if they're well known? Like popular TV shows or games and don't try and take credit. Yeah, I mean like if it's a type of thing, like I've seen something, something on TikTok that I've seen a lot recently is like people taking, like, like making themselves in the BoJack Horseman style. Like they'll be like, this is me if I was a BoJack Horseman character. And it's like, they like, you know, use the Bojack Horseman style. And like, that stuff is awesome. Like that's fan art, you know? That's not really character design, it's fan art, if it's in that sense, you know? Oh, character design can also go into fan art if you're like making like an original character. Yeah, but if we're talking about character design as in like the process of designing a character, at that point you're kind of past that and you're doing fan art of the character, you know? Mm -hmm. Just um, just once again, don't, don't commit plagiarism because that would be not nice. <laughs> 